Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For uh, those of you that didn't get the memo, when the temperature gets above 80 degrees, we wear Hawaiian shirts. Well, we're Island View Worship Center, right? But all of those that are on watching on video, we're going to tell them, we're not going to tell them we're 300 miles away from the ocean. We're an island. Amen. So we're going to uh, going to be in a Hawaiian shirt, so we're going to relax. Also, we're excited today is Dave's mom's day. We appreciate the mothers. And uh, I got a special message today, and it should go about two hours. I <laughs> know it won't. But uh, we appreciate our, our moms. If it wasn't for our moms, we wouldn't be here. The difference between our uh, moms and us guys is I raised three sons. I didn't have a privilege of having a daughter, but three sons... Uh, they fall down, and mom's, oh, well, that's okay, that's okay, and there's a boo-boo and all that stuff, and dad says, bet you won't do that again. <laughs> and uh, I got in trouble. I was building a shop out in the back of our property when we lived in Finley, and, and my middle son, he was about two, and he was out there, helped me, had the deck built. I was, had the outside walls laid out, and I was laying them out and stuff, and so I had the two-by-fours up there on the edge, and he got up and started walking on it, unbeknownst to him, and they rolled and he fell off. And banged his, his uh, cheek up, and so I got him, hugged him, all that kind of stuff. We got through all the crying and stuff, and I said, don't do that. So I went back to doing it, put everything back up, turned around, and he did it again. And so uh, that was the next day or so, we went for a family picture. And here he has this big old fat lip and all this stuff. So, uh, us, you know, <clears throat> you raise guys, you got to raise them from little, it'd be tough. And so, um, but moms, we need moms. We need our moms. We need them to nurture us, to love us, and to care for us and stuff. So we love our moms. And I thank the Lord my mom is in heaven. She's there praying for me and praying for us and waiting for us. So, hallelujah. Last week, we talked about, does anybody remember what we talk, talked about last week? It was, huh? Hallelujah. I was wondering if, man, am I wasting my time here? <laughs> All right. Cheater. <laughs> That's it. That's it. The uh, importance of a good Samaritan. When the good Samaritan, which way was he going? He was going up. And he was moved with compassion. compassion. So, let me tell just a little bit the process that I go through. There are some pastors that they can lay out their whole year, of their sermons, and they just go through through it through the year. I have never been able to do that. I tried going on vacation and doing a sermon when we were going to get back, right, you know, like on Saturday. And so I had a sermon already prepared. I sat down that Saturday night before we come into church, and I read through it and I go, <coughs> I don't feel it. And I have to I have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And like this uh, Friday, I sat down and started going, uh, okay, Lord, I haven't got anything really specific for this week. Lord, what, what do you want me to, to, to focus on this week? And, and the one thing that I kept focusing on throughout the week was thinking of the Good Samaritan. And it, he was moved with compassion. And... How important it is, compassion is, to motivate us, to move us forward. So I begin to question, where does compassion come from? 
This is my processes that I'm going through, and I'm doing some research. And there was a quote that I, I'll read to you in a little bit. And, uh, and as I was looking, I went into, on my computer, and went to search for this quote, and all of a sudden, meep, bah, bah, I had some a virus or some deal. It was, my computer's being invaded and all this kind of stuff, and I couldn't do anything to it. And so it said, give me a number to call. And so I called this number, and I was talking to this guy in India. And, uh, and so, and this was a Microsoft search program, so it was, it was their deal and stuff. And so 20 minutes later, he went through it and uh, called me back and stuff and said, okay, reset your computer, and it was fine. So, uh, they, okay, I must be on a track here that the enemy does not want me to focus on. And it's about where is your compassion? Uh, well, where is your passion? Passion leads to compassion. That's the question the Lord presented to me is where's our passion? What's, what are we passionate about? The Good Samaritan was going to Jerusalem, not down to Jericho. He was on his way up to the Lord's house. He had compassion on a man who fell among thieves. What moves us is compassion. What moves us to compassion is the passion that is in our heart. I cannot move in compassion unless I have passion in my heart. Passion is the driving force of life. You do what you're passionate about. If you're not passionate about it, you won't pay any attention to it. But if you're passionate, and it's like moms are passionate about their kids, about their grandkids. That's dads, oh, we can take them and leave them. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we're passionate about it, but not like grandmas. Grandmas love their, uh, their grandkids. And so it is that something, the passion is something that moves you deeply. It can make you do or not do. It can cause you to laugh or to cry. Passion moves you. Passion is more than an emotion for a moment in time. We misconcept that passion, I have a passionate feeling. It drives you forward to become what you are. Your passions will determine who you become. If you're passionate about be becoming a pro ball player, you're going to do everything to become a pro ball player. You will, do, you will do it, move with compassion towards that. You'll do whatever it takes. We associate passion with any intense feeling. But centuries ago, it ref as today, we, somebody's passionate, you have an intense feeling. You have an intense feeling for somebody or something. It's just that moment of feeling. But centuries ago, it referred specifically to intense, to intense pain. The sufferer of religious martyrs who were tortured and killed for their beliefs were called passions. From the Latin passio, or suffering, Jesus' last week was called Passion Week. Passion Week. It's his week of suffering. Today, we've dropped the torture from uh, the word passion. And most of us, when we were uh, not in the grips of an emotional passion, uh, pa uh, have a passion or intense interest in something or someone or something. I'm passionate about golf. Or I'm passionate about baseball. Or I'm passionate but really, it was a passion. Was a was they went into torture. The early church was passionate about who? God, the Lord. That was their passion, and that passion led them, led them into situations where they were tortured and killed for their faith. 
The difference between passion and compassion is the difference between looking inward and looking outward. Passion is a looking of inward. This is where my passion is developed. My compassion, like the, like the, product, uh, the Samaritan, his compassion in here caused him to look out and have compassion on a person. So your compassion comes from here. If you don't have passion in your heart, you're not going to have compassion outwardly. When you have passion for doing something, you feel strongly about the act of doing something that you are passionistic about. On the contrary, when you have com- compassion or feeling strong about the act of helping another person, whether or not it is mutually beneficial to you or anyone else, moving with compassion. You do it because it's the right thing to do, not because you're receiving anything back. One of the things as I was studying this that keeps bothering me is how the church in the South was not compassionate for the blacks in the South. And lynching was prominent all over the South. Why? Because their passion did not lead them to compassion. For another human being, doesn't matter the color of their skin. Building passion. These were the quotes that I was looking up when my computer locked up. The first one is William Booth. Most Christians, he was the founder, uh, president of... uh, Salvation Army. Most Christians would like to send their recruits to Bible college for five years. I would like to send them to hell for five minutes. That would do more than anything else to prepare them for a lifetime of compassionate ministry. What a powerful statement that is. Once you've tasted hell and you know what hell is like... You're going to come back, and I don't want anybody to go to kill. My enemies are are, are my closest friend. I don't want anybody to go there. Five minutes in hell. That's what he was saying. That was the quote when I put that in there. Another quote he said, I consider that the chief danger which confronts the coming century will be Religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and politics without God, and heaven without hell. What are we hearing today? Exactly what he said over a hundred years ago. I think I need to read that again. Consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century... He was back to the early of the 20th century, where we are today. Coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Oh, that Holy Ghost stuff, oh, we can't have that in the church. They are crazy. Those Pentecostal people, they are whacked out. I want to be whacked out for Jesus. Without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. What does it become? It becomes a religion. We go to church, we do our religious thing, and the rest of the week we live for us. We do whatever we want to do. We be whatever we want to be. We run around with whoever we want to run around with. It doesn't matter, but at least I went to church on Sunday, so I, I'm good. We have politicians that claim to be religious people, but every law they're passing is anti-God, anti-church, anti-people. It's about control, domination, and manipulation of the culture. Who's their God? It's not that God. Forgiveness without repentance. Repentance. If you don't know what it is, this is the simplest illustration. I'm going this way. I come to a point. I know I'm wrong. 
I turn and I go this way. That's repentance. I find out I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I turn and I go with the Lord. Now repentance is not doing this. Oh, i got to make a change in my life. My heart is back there. But I'm a Christian. I'm going to church. But my heart is over there. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Well, I accepted my G- Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Let me hang around with you for a while and I'll tell you if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Has he regenerated your life? Has he come into your life and you have given your life and have him come in and transform your life? What I used to do, I don't do anymore. I have changed. That's what I was. That's not what I am. I have repented. I have accepted Jesus Christ. I've entered into a passion relationship with Jesus Christ. Passionately, He come into my life. And because of that passion, I turn. And I repent. And I go the other way. Passion. So what happens with the, a lot of the world, the tr- people in the church, is they have this the religious encounter, but they don't experience the passion of it. It doesn't come into my heart and into my life and transform me. I am a sinner. I am going to hell. I have no hope without Jesus. Jesus, come and save me. Save me. I'm broken. I see how broken I am. And I've got to change. Lord, and I can't do it without you, Jesus. Thank you that you went to the cross and died for my sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I enter into a passionate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me. He set me free from hell. And gave me a relationship with my Father in heaven. An eternal relationship that I would live with Him forever. Because passion came into me about the relationship. And not a religious decision that I made. And out of that passion that came into my life, I have compassion and share the gospel, share the truth, to share love and accept people in their sin and love them and hopefully to bring them to Christ so they will have that passionate experience with God that will transform and change their life. Religion will not change you. Religion's a game of the enemy that keeps you bound. But passion in Christ causes us to be transformed and changed. I consider a chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics. Politics without God and heaven without hell. That's what we're seeing in our culture today. That's what we're seeing in America today. And churches all over this nation, and I've shared the statistics about it. Oh, we can't share these things because people might leave the church and we'll lose our offering. You know, my success in the kingdom of God as a pastor is not based on how many people come to church. Whether it's 10, 50, 100, or 1,000, that's in his hands. I have to be faithful to do what he tells me to do and to receive from him what he wants me to speak to you. To help you become what God wants you to be. But how many churches are based upon their attendance? Well, I'm successful as a pastor because I have 5,000 people coming to my church. (laughs) 
Well, how many people are just what we read here? They're doing their religious thing. They're not confronted with their sin. They're not confronted in in the issues of their life that I go to church. I go to so-and-so's church. And that gives me prestige because I go to that church. It's a church of 10,000 people. Well, whoop de doo Hopefully there's some saved there. The secret of Christians' passion is simple. Everything that we do in life, we do it as the Lord, uh, as unto the Lord and not to men. David Jeremiah. I am a pastor to the Lord, and however many he brings here, that's him. I don't base my success on how many people are here. Whether it's 10, 50, 100,000, that doesn't matter to me. My identity is found in the Lord. And in my, when I go home, I say, Lord, have I done what you've asked me to do today? If I have missed it, please forgive me and help me do better next week. Because I have passion for the Lord. I have passion in that relationship with Him. And because of that passion, I have compassion to share the truth of the gospel. The true message. That there is a consequence to our action. And if we reject that consequence, the outcome is not very pleasant. The sad thing to say, there's going to be a lot of people that go to church every Sunday that are going to the wrong place. Because they never found the passion in their heart. Christ did not die to make good works merely possible or to produce a half hearted pursuit. He died to produce in us a passion for good deeds. Christian purity is not the mere (coughs) avoidance of evil, but the pursuit of good. I'm just not trying not to do bad things. I don't want to do bad things. I love my wife with all my heart. I will not, before God and before her, I will never commit adultery. Because I am a passionate love and love with her. The same as I am in passionate love with my Lord, Jesus Christ. And because of that passion, I will not sin. As I've shared before, that 2 $3 item I stuck in my pocket and we checked out at, at Home Depot. And we paid for everything that we had, but went to get my keys, and oh, here's this thing, $3 item. I was already past security. I was already out in the parking lot. All I had to do was get in the car and go home. But no, I turned around and go back because I didn't want that on my conscience. Because I'm in passionate love about him, and I don't want anything to risk the relationship that I have with him because in doing so, it will affect you. We sat under pastors back... When we were married, the pastor that married us, and the, church, the pastor that was there before, he ran away, the first pastor of the church ran away with the secretary. They had had an affair. The second pastor that married us, he ran away with the piano player after a 26-year affair. And he's the one that married us. What do you think was really common in the church? Divorce. The scripture tells us out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. I'm accountable for every word I speak. If I have sin in my life and I don't deal with it, that sin is being propagated amongst you. I may not even talk about it, you may not even know about it. But the spirit that's being transmitted is not the Holy Spirit, it's the spirit of sin. People with passion for Christ want to follow Him. 
They want to learn as much as possible about him, his teaching, and his commands. Passionate Christians love Jesus, love Christ. If you're passionate for Christ, you desire to grow in your faith and want to have biblical fellowship with other believers. God is passionate about having a relationship with us as a parent with the child. God, the Father, wants to have a relationship with you. The most important relationship that you have in your life is your relationship with God. My marriage is second. He's the most important. Not my children. He is the most important because if I have this right, this will go right. I will move with compassion outwardly. I will move towards compassion towards my wife. I will move towards compassion with my children. Because I love him, I love them. And he loves them through me. God is passionate about having a relationship with us as a parent with a child. God, in his infinite love, created a way for us to have a relationship with him. He sent his son, Jesus, who laid down his life to bridge the gap between God and us. Jesus is that bridge between us and the Father. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, which lets us know God loves us. Because he wants to have relationship with you. God the Father, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, could have just said, okay, let's just start over. Wipe it all out, we'll start all over again. But he wants us to love him because we choose to love him. Have you ever heard of arranged marriages? They go into these arranged marriages and they don't love each other. If we don't have passion in our heart towards Jesus, it's just an arranged marriage. We don't really love we're just going through the function, the motions that we have this relationship. But there's nothing there. There's no passion there. No compassion there. It's just an arrangement. Is that the kind of relationship the body of Christ should have? Or should it be a passionate relationship that I'm willing to die for you, Lord Jesus? The early church, our early church fathers were willing to sacrifice themselves to save a soul. And if that means to die for my faith, so be it. I'm already dead. I died in 1970 when I was buried in the waters of baptism. I'm dead, buried, and resurrected. I can't die again. This, this body will cease to function but I will never die. Die means going to hell. Even if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you will not die, but you determine where you want to go. We associate passion with intense feelings. But centuries ago, it referred specific to, to intense pain. We already did that. Where are we here? Oh, wow, I got uh, way back here. No wonder. I guess we'll start over. <laughs> Did I, what was the last scripture I had up there? Oh, okay. All right. Let's put Romans 6.22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God... You have your fruit in holiness and the end everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. God is more passionate for us than we could ever be for him. 
He did everything for us to give us every opportunity. We feel his love, care, not through resolving our problems from our sins, but he send, by sending the Holy Spirit. After Jesus rose from the dead, he promised his disciples that although he had to leave, he would send us a helper. Me putting together these sermons, that's the Holy Spirit and me communicating together what he, the Holy Spirit, wants to speak to us. Not what I went through as a sermon book and said, well, this is, this, this is what you do for this date. Mother's Day, this would be Mother's Day. I probably should talk a little more about mothers, but moms... How many moms want their kids saved? How many moms want their kids to have eternal life? That's the greatest treasure is that we have eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. John 14. And I, I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper that He may abide with you for how long? Forever. The Holy Spirit will abide with us forever. Not just here on earth, forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, the world has no concept. And there's religious churches that reject the Holy Spirit. We don't want anything to do with that charismatic stuff, that, that Holy Spirit stuff. We don't want anything to do with that because it turns up, it, it makes a mess. You know what? We need the Holy Spirit to come in sometimes and mess us up. We need to get messed up. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. In you. Father God, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are passionate about having fellowship with you. God wants to have fellowship with every one of us. 2 Corinthians 4.7 But we have this, this treasure in jars of clay. To show that, there, <clears throat> that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. When we move and pray in the Spirit and we pray over people, I'm praying and I'm believing that we're coming into a, a most miraculous time that the church has ever experienced since the early church that moved in signs and wonders and miracles, that lay hands on the sick. We have, we've had, had uh, pictures of Azusa Street. I don't know if I still have any copies, but I had a copies of the children of Azusa Street, children who sat under the pews, under the place there, and watched what was going on. And a man came up for prayer had his arm ripped out of his shoulder, an industrial accident. They laid hands on him and prayed for him. Everyone watched a brand new arm grow out. God wants to do miracles. But are we willing to step up and say, God, I believe you and I will pray. And I will believe for a miracle and a signs and wonder. Psalm 1611, you may know, you may be known to me, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. We love because He first loved us. (sighs) 
I'm going to stop right here. Because I got nine more points to go here. <laughs> so I think we'll pick this up next week. Because I want the, the most important thing right now is if you are lacking passion in your heart for God, as we enter into worship, Dan, as we enter a time of worship, let this morning be a time you pursue God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And I want to pray as, as we enter into this time. I want God to touch you with a passion for Him that you've never experienced before. If it's been dried up, or if it's never existed, or if it's just, I don't know where I'm at, or whatever. The greatest gift that God can give us is passion for Him. To love Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And if we're in any religious mindset of religion, or church, or all this kind of stuff, I pray that be gone. It's all about relationship. The depths of a relationship with our Heavenly Father who loves us so much that He was willing to sacrifice His Son Jesus on the cross and tortured for us that at the moment we accept Him and we invite Him to come into our heart, into our life, we are transformed and we are born again. We are a new creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. But what happens is the devil wants us to take our, our eyes off of the Lord, get it on the circumstances around us. Well, I don't see things happening and all that kind of stuff. Or, I, you know, I don't know where I'm at with God. This morning, the Holy Spirit is saying, come to me. Let me renew you. Let me awaken in your heart. Let me awaken in your spirit a new birth of my presence in you. He wants us to experience him. Nineteen seventy two, February. I can go back to the moment, I can take you right to the place that I was praying. It was a second night. My sister, some of you may not have heard the story. I'll just do it real quick. My sister had moved to Alaska with her husband. She, God, doctor said she could never have children. Went to a church in Alaska with her and her husband. She had one adopted son. Went to church. There was a ministry was going on, and they were called up. For, uh, they were wanting to get, believing God for they would get pregnant. They laid hands on them. That month she conceived. She had the doctor write a note, sign it, and send it to the family. Dolores is pregnant. She was never to have children. Doctors had said she could never have children. What did God do? He healed her. When my mom and dad come back, they heard about the Holy Spirit in Alaska. They came back, told me about it. The second night I prayed, the Holy Spirit come into my life. That's my heart cry to my Heavenly Father that loves me. I don't know what I'm saying, but in my spirit, it's my spirit crying out to God, I love you. That's how we have an intimacy with God. He gave us the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came that we could experience God. Where God moves from here, religion, to here, relationship. And in that relationship with Him, 
And that's why I pre- when I prepare these sermons and stuff, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. And He's given me thoughts and He's given me things and to, to look here and look there and stuff. And He puts it all together. I can't do it. He does it. But because of that relationship that I have with Him and decisions that Shirley and I made in our life when He called us to go to Yakima, we just thought, well, that's a good idea to go start a church in Yakima, sell the house I, I, I built for us to retire in. And Tanya came out and said it was one of the uh, 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 hallmark decisions that we made to build that house. That God was in that. And we sold that house because the Lord said, I want you to go to Yakima. Come on. He said, okay, Lord, if you want us there, we're willing. And we sold it. We moved to Yakima. And God moved in our lives up there, moved tremendously. And then when Pastor Roy asked us to come back and pray about coming back, we didn't want to come back. We left it up there. And I made the mistake and I prayed and asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want us to do? And the Holy Spirit says, you've got to go back and take care of your family. That's why I see you as my family. Because the Holy Spirit called me back here to take care of my family. Those that have come and those that have gone and those that are here and those that will come are my family. He didn't call me back to be a great pastor. He called me back to love my family, his family. And it's because of the Holy Spirit inside of us that leads us and move. I do this because of passion for Him. And I pray that I move with compassion towards each one of us. That each one of us can, can become what God has called us to be. My greatest joy as a father is to see my sons grow up to be successful in life. Has everything been perfect? No. But they are successful men. And my greatest joy is to see our church become successful in the kingdom of God. Whatever God calls us to do, and whatever God calls you to do, that we will be successful. That we will have an impact in the Tri-Cities, in the Columbia Basin, that people will know us, not because we have the greatest worship team, but we do. They're, they're pretty great. Amen. Not because we're the biggest church in town, but because we have faith to move mountains. Amen. Because we have, we have a father that we're passionately in love with. We have a brother, Jesus, that we're passionately in love with. We have a Holy Spirit that dwells in us we're passionately in love with. And because of that relationship, it doesn't, to, numbers don't mean anything to me. It's hearts that mean something. Whether it's one, ten, thousand, ten thousand. But I believe God is going to bring increase in every one of our lives. Because I prophesy this. Over the next few days, watch the passion in your heart increase towards God. I prophesy this to us right now. Passion. The passion for your heavenly Father is going to increase and it's going to take you deeper than you've ever been before. Because this is His message. This is not my message. This is what He wanted me to tell you. And as a mother loves its child with great passion, God has great passion for you greater than that. And he wants you to be successful in everything that you do in the kingdom of God and that you will be victorious. Amen? Amen. I think we need to worship the Lord. Exalt him. Exalt him in your heart. Exalt him in your spirit. Let him, let him overflow you. Let him fill you with his presence. And take, you, and take you where he wants to take you and say, Lord, here am I, use me. Here am I, open my heart. Here am I, reveal in my spirit. Take us deeper. Take us deeper, Lord.